Okay, so I get emails a lot from uh, neurotypical wives who state that when they get into a conflict or an argument with their high-functioning autistic husband, he always has to make her wrong. And uh, so we want to look at that real quickly. So if I have Asperger's or high-functioning autism, I have what is referred to as a developmental disorder which means that my social emotional brain is underdeveloped so in other words my social intelligence and my emotion, emotional intelligence is low compared to my logical brain in fact you could think of high functioning autism as a disorder of social skills so as a result of having a low functioning social emotional brain i have this thing called mind blindness in other words, I have a hard time predicting what might be in the mind of another individual, what they might be thinking or feeling. So if I'm the person uh, with high-functioning autism and I'm dealing with my neurotypical spouse in this example, I truly have no clue how she might be thinking or feeling. Therefore, when she has a perspective or opinion that's different, different from mine, I simply can't wrap my brain around her perspective. In fact, her viewpoint will make utter nonsense to me. So since I am blind to her perspective, I will tend to view her differing opinion as she is disagreeing with me. And then I'll tend to make a thinking error and say to myself, because she's disagreeing with me, therefore she's against me. And then I'll tend to make another thinking error and say to myself, because she's against me, I must defend myself and prove that she is wrong and illogical. Because if I don't make her wrong, that means I'm wrong. But only one person can be right, and that person must be me, since my perspective is the only perspective that I can see. Emphasis on the term see right there. So, in other words... Since I can't comprehend her thoughts or feelings, therefore her thoughts and feelings are not valid. Therefore, she's wrong and I'm right. Okay, so now we want to look at why your partner or spouse with Asperger's syndrome or high functioning autism tends to blame you for the relationship difficulties. If you, for example, are a neurotypical wife in a marriage with a husband with Asperger's syndrome, you probably have discovered that whenever there are issues or conflict, you are the bad guy, and he blames you for the relationship difficulties. And you may have had the thought many times, he is such a selfish, insensitive, uncaring bastard. And what if I were to tell you that that's probably not the case, rather the fact that he's not responding the way you would hope is due to one of the traits that he suffers from. We're specifically talking about theory of mind deficits. So well, let's look at that briefly. Theory of mind is an important social cognitive skill that involves the ability to uh, think about mental states, both your own and those of others. It involves the ability to attribute mental states, including emotions, desires, beliefs, and knowledge. Not only does the theory of mind involve thinking about thinking, but it also refers to the ability to understand what uh, the the ability to understand that others' thoughts and beliefs may be different from your own, and to consider the factors that have led to those mental states. Now, why is this called theory of mind? Well. Psychologists refer to uh, this as a theory of mind because our beliefs about what might happen or what might be going on in another person's head are just that, theories. They're kind of uh, educated guesses. While we make predictions, you know, we, we can definitely make predictions, but we have no direct way of knowing exactly what a person might be thinking or what their motivations might be. All we can rely on is our own theories or hypotheses that we develop based on what people say, how they act, what we know about their personalities, and uh, what we can infer about their intentions. So why is this theory of mind stuff so important? 
Well, the emergence of a theory of mind is really critical during the developmental process. Very young children tend to be more egocentric, as I'm sure the parents in here are aware of, and are often unable to think about the mental states of others. Now, as people age, their theory of mind does emerge and continues to develop. So forging a strong theory of mind plays an important role in our social worlds as we work to understand how people think, to predict their behavior, to engage in social relationships, to solve interpersonal conflicts, and so on. So in order to interact with other people, it's important to be able to understand their mental states and to think about how those mental states might influence their actions. So in other words, you can you connect your guesstimate about what they're thinking with your guesstimate about how they may act based on their thinking. And this is all stuff that you do at a very unconscious level as a neurotypical. These things come come about almost at an uh, just automatically, it's a natural state of mind, not so much with people with Asperger's. Theory of mind allows people to infer the intentions of others, as well as to think about what's going on in someone else's head, including hopes, fears, beliefs, expectations, and so on. So social interactions, as you know, are, can be very complex, even for neurotypicals. And misunderstandings can make them even more complex and confusing. By being able to develop accurate ideas of what other people are thinking, or at least fairly accurate ideas, we're better able to respond accordingly. So here is the problem. People with Asperger's and high-function autism have great difficulty with this theory of mind business. In fact, there's a lot of research on this that reveals that um, people on the autism spectrum have trouble using theory of mind to make moral judgments in many situations. There was one study that specifically found that Asperger's adults were more likely than neurotypical subjects to blame other people for their problems. And this is what I say, you may have experienced this with your husband who has Asperger's syndrome. So the judgments of people with Asperger's rely more on outcome of the incident rather than on understanding the other person's intentions. Let me, re let me state that again. The judgments of people with Asperger's and high-functioning autism tend to rely more on the outcome of the incident rather than on understanding the other person's intentions. Here's an example, and this was part of the research. And uh, in one scenario, James had a, a friend, and they were snowmobiling in an area known for loose snow. So this friend asks James if he should take an easterly route around a row of pine trees. And James had uh, looked, at, looked it up, and he did a little quick analysis while they were on the slopes, and he found out that uh, they, they had an alert that avoiding the west slope was the safest way to go. And so he told his friend that going you know, the east route would probably be okay. So the friend takes off in that direction, and st and, but unfortunately starts an avalanche, which quickly overtook him and buried him alive. Now, in this scenario... And this was a, just a hypothetical scenario that the researchers put forth before these subjects. The researchers found that people with Asperger's were more likely than neurotypical subjects to blame James for his friend's death, even though James believed the slope was harmless. So that was kind of a, an interesting research project that does reflect the fact that judgments of people with Asperger's do tend to rely more on outcomes rather than on uh, inferring what the other person's intentions were. So that was a long way around the bush to get to the point, and that is this is why your partner or spouse with Asperger's or high-function autism does tend to blame you for the uh, relationship difficulties because he's only looking at the outcomes, you know, in other words, what happened after the argument rather than trying to understand your thoughts, feelings, motivations, intentions, 
and so on. So I have a question here from my neurotypical wife, and she states, My husband with Asperger's seems to have a better relationship with his mother than with me. There's certainly more intimacy and consideration there. I don't mean in the sexual nature, of course, but he and his mother are like buddies, and I'm kind of like the outsider in that group. Well, keep in mind that your husband with Asperger's has a developmental disorder. So that simply means that developmentally, his social intelligence and emotional intelligence is low compared to his logical brain. Um, so therefore, this concept of, uh, we'll just call it social hierarchy, for lack of a better term, would perhaps be a foreign concept to him. We could also call it prioritized allegiance. And all I mean by that is um, there's kind of this hidden rule that when you get married, um, your wife kind of takes the first spot and, and mommy takes the second spot. And I don't mean with respect to level of love, but typically you cleave unto your wife, right? And the marriage comes first, the kids come second, extended family members come third uh, with respect to how you treat people, not necessarily level of love. So um, when uh, you don't feel like a priority, uh, and, and you perceive that his mom is more of a priority than you, I think what's really going on there is just a confusion uh, due to low social emotional intelligence uh, around uh, prioritized allegiance. Um, so you could have a 35-year-old man with high-functioning autism or Asperger's who emotionally is more like a 14-year-old so at some level, it's kind of like an adult child who has never truly left home in the emotional sense. So to emotionally detach from mommy in a healthy, more mature way um, is probably not going to happen uh, to the degree that it would with somebody who does not have a developmental disorder. Okay, guys, of course, there's no magic bullet to save your marriage. But if there ever was one, it would be this. So listen up. Your wife has felt disconnected, unloved, uh, that she was not important to you, that you're not giving her enough quantity time or quality time or empathy. And so what can you do in the event that you want to work on the relationship? Well, three things. You want to listen. You want to paraphrase back what she said using your words and you want to take action based on what she has requested, based on her needs, wants, or expectations. So she feels unheard, she feels misunderstood, and she feels like you are more interested in your work or your special activity more so than her. So since she wants to be heard and understood and for you to follow through with things that you say you're going to do, to help the relationship, then your job is to listen, paraphrase back using your words, and implement. We're going to call that LPI. You want to listen as in put your phone down, get off the computer, look her in the eyes, or at least look her in the same, look in her direction at least. Give her the indication that you're listening. When she's done, you're going to paraphrase back, not parrot back, but paraphrase back what you heard. So A, she will know you listened to her, and B, she will know that you understood her because you used your words to describe back what she just said. If you paraphrase back and she says, no, that's not exactly what I meant, then she can repeat what she said, and then you can try again with your paraphrase. And then the third and final step then would be for you to follow through with some form of action based on what she needs or wants or what her expectations are. So, LPI, listen, paraphrase, implement. In working with clients on the autism spectrum, what I see pretty much 100% of the time is the individual's tendency to chronically get lost in thought, usually stressful thoughts. The autistic brain is very rarely paying attention to what's going on in the present moment. 
oftentimes the individual is either ruminating about a past stressful event or worrying about the potentiality of a future stressful event or they're simply experiencing stress in the present moment, the event that's occurring now. And the only reprieve they get from being lost in this rabbit hole of random stressful thinking is to get lost mentally in their special interest or their preferred activity. They're rarely at peace in the present moment, unless the present moment involves their mental engagement with their preferred activity. Now, we all have random unwanted thoughts that show up in our head without permission. We call these automatic thoughts. But when I work with individuals on the spectrum, I have just gathered a ton of anecdotal evidence from uh, personal reports that their brain seems to run on autopilot without their permission pretty much 24-7. You know, we don't have to beat our heart. It beats without us putting forth any effort. In the same way, it appears that the autistic brain thinks without the individual putting in effort towards thinking. In other words, he's no longer in charge of his thoughts. Rather, his thoughts are in charge of him. He is literally a prisoner of chronic intrusive thinking patterns and this translates to chronic anxiety to one degree or another, which in turn leads to the strong need to reduce the anxiety, which usually comes in the form of distraction through the use of a preferred activity or a preferred thought stream. Okay, we have another question here. She states, my partner has high functioning autism. When I talk to him about something that's important to me, he will zone out or he will pretend to be paying attention. But I always know when he has not heard me because he won't follow through with what he said he was going to do. He will agree to do something, but later will not complete the task. Well, what could be going on here and what I see most often is brain overload. And what I mean by that is the people with high-functioning autism, they're, they're people that are living in a verbal world, but they're actually visual learners. And so in the event that you are giving him too much information and maybe you're upset with him and you're droning on, to use a sarcastic term, for 10 and fif- or 15 minutes or more, he's going, to reach, <clears throat> he's going to reach data overload. But he might give you the impression that he's still absorbing your words. He might pretend that he's listening and understanding. But what's really going on is his brain has literally at some level short-circuited, and he's not absorbing the information anymore. And that will occur at about the five-minute mark. That's why you would want to keep your instruction short and concrete. Because if you go long, especially 10, 15 minutes, and you're animated and upset with him, He is going to take a mental vacation in order to keep from getting overwhelmed. In other words, he's going to go off in his own little imaginary world just to escape from this uh, stressful sensory input, which would be the words that you're throwing at him. Another thing that could be going on is he may quickly agree to do whatever you are telling him to do or asking him to do just to get the conversation over with. Um, and this again is he's not purposely trying to be insensitive or to disregard your concerns or your needs or wants Um, perhaps the way that uh, you're going about it is stressing him out and he just wants yeah okay honey I'll do it fine yeah I'll get to it just just to reduce his anxiety um The other thing that could be going on, too, is, as you know, he probably has only one or two special interests. And if you give him some boring, mundane task that falls way outside of his special interest, boredom is excruciating to people on the autism spectrum. And so, since he only has one or two things that he prefers, and you give him some mundane task that's way outside of his special interest... He's going to get distracted doing his special interest and not get to the task that you want him to do. And he's probably going to forget about the task that you want him to do because he's absorbed in what he wants to do. So if you're a person with Asperger's syndrome and you struggle with anxiety, which most people on the autism spectrum do, here are 10 
quickie little strategies to try and nothing here is going to be very profound or new for you but uh, sometimes the simplest stuff is the most effective stuff so the first thing is slow deep belly breathing um, especially focus on the exhalation try to make that anywhere between five and ten seconds so when you're anxious your, your breathing becomes either faster or shallower in some cases I've known people to stop breathing altogether for a period of time. So try deliberately slowing down your breathing. You can count to three as you breathe in slowly and then count to three as you breathe out slowly. Another one that everybody's familiar with is progressive muscle relaxation. So you're going to find a quiet location, close your eyes and slowly tense and then relax each of your muscle groups. You can do this from your toes to your head or any points. You can just focus on one point, perhaps, you know, lower back and abdomen. So you're going to hold the tension for three seconds and then release quickly. And this can reduce the feelings of muscle tension that often comes from anxiety. Another familiar but very effective method for dealing with anxiety is to stay in the present moment. Anxiety can make your thoughts live in a terrible future that hasn't happened yet. So you want to try to bring yourself back to where you are and this is a form of meditation in a, in a sense also take small acts of bravery would you want to try that avoiding what makes you anxious provides some relief in the short term but can make you more anxious in the long term so try approaching something that makes you anxious even in a small way the way through anxiety is by learning that what you fear isn't likely to happen, and if it does, you'll be able to cope with it. Also, you want to challenge your self-talk. How you think obviously affects how you feel. We all know that. Anxiety can make you overestimate the danger in a situation or underestimate your ability to handle it, though. So try to think of different interpretations to a situation that makes you anxious rather than just jumping to the worst case scenario which most people with Asperger's syndrome tend to do from time to time so look at the facts for and against your thought being true also you can plan worry time just set aside time to worry it's hard to stop worrying entirely so you know have some time to indulge your worries it could just be 10 minutes you could even write them down and then after that 10 minutes, you say, okay, that's my worry time, so I'm going to get on with life now, and I can have more worry time later today or tomorrow, but for now, I'm going to put my worry on hold. You can also keep a diary of your anxiety. You want to look for the patterns um, and you know plan, plan the day accordingly. So get to know your anxiety. Keep a diary of when it's at its best and when it's at its worst, and then... Uh, Lastly, you can learn from others, especially people that also have Asperger's syndrome. Pick their brain. What have they done to deal with their anxiety?